I'm your host, Charlie Winham, and I'm inside the recently opened State Museum in Baton Rouge. It is filled with the rich sights and sounds of Louisiana's story. This is the perfect spot for anyone with questions about Louisiana. We also thought it would be the perfect setting to ask our continuing question of what's in a name. And our journey will include climbing to the top of Mount Lebanon, and we'll also head to the communities of New Roads, Iowa, and Abita Springs. But first, we will begin with the oldest permanent settlement in the Louisiana, first Louisiana, back in 1714. And the history of this community is well preserved. If you talk with some of the locals, you'll get an idea that Natchitoches is the perfect spot just to hang out and learn more about Louisiana history. Or simply sit down and eat a meat pie. Or keep your eyes open. You just might see some Hollywood movie stars. The town of Natchitoches is so charming and so beautiful, you'd have thought it came right out of a Hollywood movie lot. In fact, it's the other way around. Hollywood has come to Natchitoches to make several movies, including Steel Magnolias, The Horse Soldiers, and Man in the Moon. But before we dive into Natchitoches going Hollywood, how did Natchitoches get its name? For that, we go back nearly 300 years when the Caddo Indians lived off the land, and the French Marines built a fort. When the French first came here, and they first came in 1701, but when they established the settlement here in 1714, the French were, uh, no, what they usually did was they named the place uh, for the group, the Native American group that was living there. Mm -hmm. So this was uh, their post at the Natchitoches. Is there a translation at all to Natchitoches? Well, Natchitoches, of course, is a Caddo on word. In Caddo, na means place or place of. And the closest pronunciation that I, I can produce for you is in Caddo, it was na sitos. And sitos means pawpaw. So this was, in Caddo, place of the pawpaw. Now pawpaw is a, a fruit that people ate, and it was a food source. We're in uh, Fort St. Jean Baptiste State Historic Site. This is one of our Louisiana State Parks. And this is a, a reproduction of the fort that was built here in 1716. Uh, the French came here, established a fort, in order to more define their border between French Louisiana and Spanish Texas. What we do here is we educate people on our rich colonial history. The people uh, who came here uh, gave us so many of the traditions that we have today. And it all started with the French colony here, and it started because of the French putting Fort St. Jean Baptiste here and a community developing around it. We have uh, staff members who dress in our costumes every day. They're doing activities every day, whether it's tanning hides or, or cooking on open flame fire or cooking on the hearth or, or shooting their muskets or doing any kind of activities that the French Marines have been doing during this time period. Staff members can take their lead from the scores of Hollywood actors who came to Natchitoches over the years, including John Wayne in The Horse Soldiers, Reese Witherspoon in Man in the Moon. But the town hosted a juggernaut of Hollywood divas when Steel Magnolias was filmed entirely in Natchitoches and released in 1989. The screenplay was based on the stage play written by Natchitoches native Robert Harling. And the Eatonton family home portrayed in the movie became the Steel Magnolia bed and breakfast two and a half years ago after Paul and Karen Reinhardt purchased it from the Taylor family. It was a beautiful place. Thank you. Beautiful place. Thank I you. believe I've seen this kitchen. Yes, I believe you have. If you've watched <laughs> the movie, you certainly have. Yeah. Do you get a whole lot of questions about yes. the movie? I, I can only imagine you get you know, hundreds of questions. Hundreds, hundreds. People enjoy watching the movie while they're in the house that it's filmed in. And as far as we know, it's the only house that you can actually come and stay in the house where a movie was filmed. The bedrooms are named? They're named after characters in the movie. Such as? We've got uh, the Shelby room, which was uh, wallpapered, uh, pink, pink wallpaper uh, for the movie. We still have that same wallpaper and same drapes there. Uh, we have the Jackson room, which is the Jackson, the room that uh, Jackson 
uh, climb through the window to see Shelby in the bathtub. And then we have the Clary room, uh, that's named after Clary in the movie, and then the Malin room, which is kind of set up as a, as a mother, motherly type room. And we're going to do a third floor and we're going to put Weezer in the attic. So we're going to have Weezer's attic when we get through with it. <laughs> Paul and Karen say they have already hosted over 700 guests, including fans of the movie as far away as Europe and Australia. And watching the movie from inside the home gives guests an unforgettable experience. Even people who aren't necessarily that big of movie buffs have just got the biggest kick out of watching the movie in the house it was filmed in. You'll hear them get up and they'll stop the movie and run to wherever the, the movie is and discuss that uh, particular set. Every angle you go can remind you of this movie. Absolutely. This is uh, one of the original movie posters here that was actually given to us by friends in Dallas when they found out we'd bought the house. They uh, found it and purchased it, had it framed and gave it to us. The perfect housewarming Absolutely. <laughs> The movie Steel Magnolias certainly put this place on the map, which brings up a new dilemma. How do you pronounce the name of this place? Is it Natchitoches, Natchitoches, Natchitoches? You get the idea. And if you think pronouncing the name of this town is tough, just try and take a crack at spelling it. Well, that's when a former mayor put together a little sticker campaign to help remedy that. Heck, I got hit twice this afternoon. I use the uh, Cajun. Nakatish. <laughs> Somebody asked me to spell it, and I spell it something. That don't sound like Nakatish as well. Just take it and leave it. Is that why maybe a whole lot of those stickers went out the right That's an, That was another good reason. We try to uh, work with the Chamber and the Tourist Commission. We really push. I love Nakatish. It's my hometown. And uh, the people here have just been so grateful to, and to serve 20 years in a place like Nakatish is just, uh, it's just a dream. For meals that will stick to your ribs, his dream certainly includes Lassione's Meat Pie Kitchen, started 38 years ago by James Lassione. His daughter Angela dishes up the restaurant specialty, Lassione's Meat Pie Platter. This is our homemade brown gravy that we make every morning. It's made from our beef stock that we do with our homemade beef stew, and of course our homemade dirty rice, and I got some meat pies over this way. We've already got fried up here. Before the dough has a lot to do with it. But we fry ours in peanut oil. Uh, a lot of people want to know about baking them. We, re we recommend a fry them. The dough reacts a little differently when they're baked. It's a little bit tougher. Uh, so we, we fry them in peanut oil just two or three minutes because the meat's already cooked. You're just browning the dough. So you just so they can swim a little bit, put them in there, let them do the backstroke, and here you go. The city of Natchitoches is the oldest permanent settlement in the Louisiana Purchase. What once was known as the Red River is now Cane River Lake, a peaceful 30-mile stretch of water that runs from downtown Natchitoches to the plantation country. So the next time you're thinking about heading to a charming little town that's larger than life, full of laughter, good food and friendly people, just do what Hollywood does. Come to Louisiana. Come to Natchitoches. Screenplay writer Robert Harling was also honored a few years ago by LPB as a Louisiana legend. Well, it's now time to travel the Mississippi River and into Point Capi Parish. Our next stop, New Roads. French Canadian explorers led by Iberville traveled the Mississippi back in 1699. Thanks to a shortcut in their travels, they created the foundation of this settlement. Discovering and preserving history of the community of New Roads is a time honored tradition. The family of New Roads native and author Brian Costello goes back 11 generations, and he's taken note of it. In fact, reams of notes. Brian, how many books on Point Capi history have you written? Sixteen. Sixteen? That's quite a lot. Well, there's a lot of water in the well. Um, <laughs> every day I'm finding out something interesting from the civil and sacramental records and old newspaper accounts that tell of 
the rich history, culture, and traditions of this community. Is there a lot of rich history? Oh, absolutely. Uh, back to the days of the French explorers in 1699, we have written accounts of life, customs, and genealogy in this community. How did New Roads get its name? New Roads uh, got its name from the New Road, which we are actually walking down. Right down here. Right. <laughs> R runs from False River to the Mississippi River. Uh -huh. And it was open about 1776 as a Camino Real, a royal road project of the Spanish authorities. So this new road is over 200 years old. A very old road, <laughs> exactly. Um, it's a shortcut between False River and the Mississippi River. And the French called it the Chemin Neuf, which is French for New Road. And if you look on the street signs in this part of town, the original area uh -huh. uh, that was carved out in 1822, you'll see on the sign Chemin Neuf. Before we understand the history of new roads, it helps to understand the Mississippi River about 300 years ago. Back around 1700, this was the Mississippi River, but it changed course. And the current body of water here that is now cut off is known as False River. By the early 1700s, the new road that connected False River to the Mississippi River was the foundation to this new settlement. This was a, a huge trail for commerce? Right. Uh, well, of course, it was a dirt road um, until 1918. It was graveled at that point uh -huh. and paved in 1931. Uh, the produce from False River, like sugarcane and cotton, were brought from the Falls River plantations to the Mississippi River for export, and goods were imported down this road, such as uh, dry goods, hardware, groceries, other items needed for homes. Over the early years of the 20th century, the new road of new roads changed from a dirt trail to a gravel top, and then paved by 1931. And with the advent of the automobile coming down the pike, one of this town's cornerstone businesses was Satterfield Motors. O.J. Bellows' dad, O.J. Sr., worked there after moving his family in from Muncie, Louisiana. You know a few people in yeah, this picture. Yeah, I know, I, I, I know 90% of them. And your dad's in this picture? My dad's in the picture. What's your daddy do? Dad was automobile mechanic. Yeah? Yeah, reboard engine and that. He was the only one that could read a Mike Ramatha back then. Dad used to work late hours over here, you know, back then, me and me. I don't think he ever made $100 a week, you know, <laughs> just, just no money, you know, but he was a dedicated employee. He was the type of person who would have broken the place if they ever closed it down just to work. That's how much he was dedicated. Yeah. O.J. and wife Sarah's oh, yeah, family are yeah, just some of the newer kids on the block. Their family dates back just three generations. We have eight children, so now we have 20, almost 21 grandchildren, so most of them live here and they're happy. I mean, it's an old town. They could go on the river and, and enjoy fishing. I graduated from Portridge High School. I got married in St. Mary's Church, and my first job was in the courthouse. So I've been on the streets of New Roads for a long time. <laughs> but I'm glad we stayed. <laughs> How about you? Glad you stayed? Oh, yeah, definitely. I, I don't know any place I'd rather live. We talked about moving in one time, and then I walked, rode around looking for another place. And I told her, I said, you know what? I said, we'll never find what we have here. I got it. three acres of land, place belongs to me. I'm, you know, all my kids live here, so why would I want to leave, you know? Somewhat comforting to know that uh, you, you, you've had ancestors that have lived here for 10 and 11 generations, and that's, that's a long time. That's saying a lot. And you can say that for people of uh, North American Indian ancestry, you know? Uh, European ancestry and African ancestry. We've all been here that long, and that's uh, pretty interesting when you think about it. Over the past three centuries, it's not just the Mississippi River that changed course. The name of the town changed numerous times. This community went by the names of St. Mary, named after the town's first church built in 1823. It was also named False River, Louisiana. But by 1879, it was named New Roads for Good. The town's first Mardi Gras ball was held two years later, and the New Road celebrations are the oldest Mardi Gras traditions in Louisiana outside of New Orleans. To many folks in Louisiana, this community has been considered off the beaten path. 
But these days, it is retirees making a new path for new roads as the number of waterfront retirement homes continues to grow. It's uh, being near the water here uh, for me, I guess, always. And it's, like I say, it's not essential I ever get on it again in my life, but it's essential that I see it every day. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a real sort of spiritual trip, you know, the sunrise and the sunset and the moonrise and the moonset. The natural beauty, the traditions, and the family roots deeper than the front lawn live oaks is what makes this area a Louisiana jewel. It's an undeniable truth of this town that sits along the False River. New Roads population explodes each spring for their Mardi Gras parade there. Attendance records were broken in 2002 when town officials estimated as many as 70,000 people attended the festivities. Well, our journey is just beginning. We have more wonderful towns to visit coming up in the next few moments. Towns that were started by migrating Midwestern farmers and South Carolina Baptists looking for a new home in northern Louisiana. Plus, we'll head to the source of the best spring water and old-time country music around. You're watching Lost Louisiana on Louisiana Public Broadcasting. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Lost Louisiana, What's in a Name, Part 2. I'm your host, Charlie Winham, coming to you from the State Museum in Baton Rouge. We are traveling around Louisiana to find out more about towns that made us wonder, how did they get their name? The next stop is an area named after the state of Iowa. This town was the creation of one man who masterminded a Louisiana land rush. And if you're taking notes, there are three keys to creating a land rush. First, get some land. Then get yourself a few trains and a printing press. The name of the town is Iowa, if you're wondering, and this quiet farming community of 2,600 folks may be in southern Louisiana, but this area has deep Yankee roots. Joe Barry's great-grandmother came to Iowa from where else? Iowa. She is an ancestor of one of Iowa's first families to settle here. They came from the state of Iowa, and uh, they were some of the first that came here. It was, makes it very interesting to me to look back and see, when people say, Iowa, Louisiana, because they're, they can't get over that. This was the first house built in the city of Iowa, Earl and Sarah Foster's house. John Dennison is a fifth generation farmer with Yankee roots as well. His house sits where his grandfather's log cabin used to be. My grandfather came out of the uh, North Woods, uh, Minnesota and Canada in the mid 80s and actually homestead. The mid 80s, the mid 1880s. 1880s, yeah. right. <laughs> 1880s, that's correct. 1880s. Uh, followed the timber industry down here. At that time, Lake Charles, Louisiana was a major exporting town and had probably a, a dozen sawmills here on the, on the lake and in the Lake Charles area. And he worked there and then homesteaded here and, and farmed rice, started farming rice and, and working at the sawmills and farm rice after work and do, at night. But to understand how Iowa got its name means learning about a man named J.B. Watkins and his dream of developing southwest Louisiana. With the help of Englishman H.G. Chalkley, Watkins bought up 1.5 million acres of land in southwest Louisiana. This huge mass of land would be known as the Watkins Purchase. The next part of his plan, he built a railroad from Alexandria to what would become Iowa. Next, he purchased a New York City paper called The American. Watkins brought the paper to Lake Charles. It is the current day Lake Charles American Press. And according to McNeese State University's Dr. Joe Cash, that's when JB could advertise to the world to come to make a new life in Louisiana. I have an example from 1895 mm -hmm. of, of the um, advertising uh, a trip to Lake Charles uh, and if you would uh, buy a ticket uh, to come to Lake Charles, uh, he would give you all the routes and put you on the Watkins line from Alexandria to, uh, to Lake Charles, of course to Iowa and then on to Lake Charles. 
and uh, if you didn't like it here and didn't decide to move here and stay, he gave you two dollars to go home, uh, <laughs> to get home, and that might have done it in those days. In fact, one of those families responding to the ads was Amanda and Granville Woolman. After living throughout the Midwest in Iowa, even Nebraska, they took a train from Julesburg, Colorado to this great new land. And back in 1905, they built a beautiful Victorian home in Lake Charles. It is now the home of Dr. Joe Cash. And he used the newspaper to advertise it. And uh, it was billed as the other Eden um, to get away from the cold, dark, dreary days of the North. Would your grandfather have been one of those guys that answered J.B. Watkins' ad? Yes, indeed. That's right. That's how he got down here. Sure did. Uh, J.B. Watkins advertised all over uh, the Midwest about the wonderful soil and climate of the Iowa community. He even had plans of a deep water channel from the town of Iowa to the Gulf. That never materialized, but it did happen from, from Lake Charles. Iowa is a very close-knit community, as this weekly gathering of the First Methodist Church quilters will attest. Betty Storer Mount is the great-granddaughter of the first postmaster and storekeeper, James Storer. Since 1990, they have made over 100 quilts and still easily yarn some tales of this other Eden. But I always refuse to go in the stall that held the two mules, Jack and Jill, because <laughs> they were contrary. <laughs> And then you never knew when they were going to nip you and when they were just going to scare the daylights out of you. <laughs> but it was a good life. And now that good life is getting marketed again. Where the Denison family once raised rice and cattle, some land will sprout a new crop of homes. Cities expand. People want to get out in the country. Uh, we now presently have on the drawing boards a, a fairly large subdivision that we're going to call Prairie Crossing because this is the crossing between the, the bayou land here on the river and, and the prairie, the high prairie land that the uh, Midwesterners settled. We're going to have what we call mini farms, uh, probably three to five acre plots of property for those that want to enjoy the kind of lifestyle that my family's had for over a hundred years. Back at Joe Barry's farmland, Iowa means time to come back and smell the roses and to leave her hectic days as a Baton Rouge lobbyist with husband Lynn. We came home after uh, 40 years. My husband decided he was a contractor, uh -huh. but he decided that uh, he could raise sugar cane. So he, he, turned the, he called it turning the land upside down because rice loves water, sugar cane hates water. Uh -huh. So he did, and we now have about 800 acres of sugar cane. And three generations of her family will live practically next door to the main house. She has named her farm Beulah Land after her mother. And Beulah Land means heaven. And so Iowa, Beulah, it's all together. It's the, one can't go without the other. So could a southern town named after northern people be heaven? No, it's Iowa. Midwesterners were not the only early Americans forging a new beginning in Louisiana. Over 150 years ago, eight families from South Carolina had the very same idea, and they decided to settle in northwestern Louisiana. Bienville Parish is our next stop to the town of Mount Lebanon. These days, the population is only about 70 people, but prior to the Civil War, Mount Lebanon was a thriving community. Up in northwest Louisiana, at the intersection of State Highways 157 and 517, sits the one signal town of Mount Lebanon. This community became a beacon to eight South Carolina families of Baptist persuasion. And 170 years ago, they made Mount Lebanon their home. Local historian and lifelong resident, Elizabeth Towns. So what's in the name? How did Mount Lebanon get its name? Well, they came from uh, Edgefield District, South Carolina. Mm -hmm. uh, they were all uh, biblical, had a lot of knowledge, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, the Lebanon came from the cedars of Leb Lebanon, mm -hmm. uh, from which King Solomon's temple was built. And they traveled a distance, and this was 
a hilly site, you know. <laughs> so they called it Mount Lebanon. Clearly, the cornerstone to the community is the Mount Lebanon Baptist Church, established in 1837. It's been the home church of Ruby Grubbs and her family for over 50 years. Is this a special place for you? Is this a special place for you and your family? It is. It's a haven. It really is. We, it's, there's just something sacred about the, the area around the church and the people here and everything. We're, we're just like a big family, you know, our church family uh, means a lot to all of us. One of the church's earliest preachers was a man by the name of George Baines Johnson. He is the great-grandfather of U.S. President Lyndon Baines Johnson. There are other touches of where church meets state inside this sanctuary. For example, the chandelier in the center of the church. It came from the first governor of the state, Governor Claiborne's mansion in New Orleans. And it was bought uh, prior to uh, 1948 mm -hmm. when the church celebrated its centennial. The benches are original. Our pulpit is original. History, I mean the benches, you know, being separated when the men and the women used to sit on opposite sides. And the offering uh, cups, collection cups are original and we use those on our homecoming Sunday. That's the only time they're used. They're just for looks now, just on display. It's a historic town. Not well known, of course. <laughs> I told someone I lived in Mount Lebanon and they act like they thought it was across the water. <laughs> <laughs> P.F. Eaton and her husband, Lieutenant Colonel Charles Eaton, live in one of seven Mount Lebanon homes that are on the National Register of Historic Places. This house was originally built as a hotel. It is known as the Dog Trot. How old is this home? Uh, it was built in 1847, mm -hmm. and that room back there mm -hmm. uh, was about 1838. It's called a Dog Trot. What, yes. What is a Dog Trot? A Dog Trot is an open passage between part of the house where the dogs can run in and out. They <laughs> trot right through. <laughs> so I have guests every uh, Christmas. I have a full house. Uh, we have services on Christmas Eve at the church, and one time I had 17 that walked from here to the church. So uh, all my children come home for Christmas, and most of the time their children come with them. Homes of the original South Carolina families still remain. The rich collection of historic homes also includes the Stagecoach Inn, built in 1847, and it's nestled on the corner of Huckleberry Lane and Stagecoach Trail. This home became the stop for the stagecoach on its regular runs from Shreveport to Monroe. This residence, known as Down Home, was built in 1853 and includes hand-hewn timbers as well as cypress sills put together with pegs. The Thurman Place was built in the 1850s, and the Colbert Place was home to Dr. Bartholomew Egan, one of the town's founders. Egan was born in Ireland and was the first president of Mount Lebanon University. That's right. Once upon a time, Mount Lebanon was a college town. Twelve years after the Baptist Church was organized, Mount Lebanon University was formed. This is the site of the former Mount Lebanon University. The town was very prosperous, so was the university, until the Civil War took away the young men. At first it was a Mount Lebanon female college, and then later it became co-ed. And uh, the site is just up Highway 154. Oh, babe, maybe a quarter of a mile toward Gippsland. Mm -hmm. And uh, the railroad came through Gippsland. The war was over. School began to decline. And it was later moved to uh, what is now known as Louisiana College at Pineville. Many of the Mount Lebanon memories are now preserved at the Stagecoach Trail Museum. On this day, the museum is also home to several ladies restoring a king-size quilt which nearly takes over the floor space. And now more than ever, maintaining the colorful history and heritage of Mount Lebanon is the main goal. Children leave to go to college and some of them come back, and, but most of them don't. And we understand that. But we're here because they have to, they have, to have a place to come home to. 
and so we'll keep it going. I'd rather live and die here than any place in the whole world, and I've, for a country girl, I've traveled extensively, but this is the place that we love and enjoy, and uh, we'll do all we can so those kids can keep coming back. Mount Lebanon Baptist Church organized several missions with Minden's First Baptist Church, among the most prominent today. Well, all this traveling around the state has made me thirsty, so why don't we head to the part of the state best known for its pure spring water? It's Abita Springs. This town in the middle of St. Tammany Parish gushes with many stories and myths pertaining to the deep artesian well underneath. A lion head fountain in the middle of a park is a cornerstone to the history of Abita Springs. From this fountain springs the tale of this historic site, and former mayor Brian Gowan helps us out. Brian, what's in a name? How did Abita Springs get its name? Well, there's a couple of stories. Uh huh. Historically, since you know I'm a student of history, I got to give you the straight story. Absolutely. Uh, Abita Springs. Uh, Actually, the word abita itself is derived from a Choctaw Indian term. Okay. Uh, and uh, I'm not sure what the Choctaw word was. I've seen several different spellings, maybe apitap. Not abita, though. Uh -huh. Abita is derivative. And um, they believe that the term is a Choctaw term for the source of the stream. The Abita River begins just a few yards away from here, but the source of this spring lies deep underground. Now the water coming out of this fountain is from our municipal water supply. And you say, oh gee, what's the big deal? Well, <laughs> the big deal is our municipal water supply comes from a 2,000 foot deep artesian well that supplies pure water, untreated, unfiltered, unchemicalized mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and just comes right out here this beautiful clean water. Now Brian is also a source to another story on the origin of the town's name. When centuries ago an Indian princess named Abita fell deathly ill and came to the springs. She told her husband a Spanish explorer named Enriquez to leave her there and to come back in one month. When he finally returned he figured he would either find her remains or her burial spot or he would have to add, you know, he just assumed that she would be dead. What did he find? Well, when he came, he looked and he saw nothing. And he looked around and all of a sudden this figure came running out of the woods and lo and behold, it was her in perfect health and radiant beauty. <laughs> like she was. Uh, that's a bunch of who we is. <laughs> it's, a, it's a beautiful story. It's a legend. That may more likely be the sales pitch during the early 1900s to sell the spring water to the masses. But Abita Springs native Arnold Strain can vouch for the water's quality. It had a different taste than any spring water that I ever knew about. And it got an award in 1904 as the best water in, in the country. Really? At the uh, St. Louis Exposition. I don't mean to be rude, but may I ask you how old are you? I'm 89. You're 89 years old? Yeah, I was born in 1916. Is there something in the water? Because you look pretty young. Something about the Abita Springs water might be something it good might, about it. might have had a play in it. It might have. And people used to go to the springs and get, uh, they get water. And a lot of people said that it really helped them. They'd come over from New Orleans. Doctors in New Orleans would tell people to come to Abita Springs and drink the spring water. It would help their kidneys. Many people said that it did. The pristine water and clean air drew thousands of New Orleans residents every summer, making Abita Springs a bustling resort community during the turn of the century. At one time, we had as many as 500 hotel rooms right in this little town. Doctors would even prescribe for people to come to Abita Springs to be cured of illnesses, especially respiratory diseases like tuberculosis. Mm -hmm. And uh, they believed that the air had a quality that they referred to as ozone, uh, and they called this the ozone belt. Here, the healing and destructive powers of water meet head on. Over 100 years ago, the spring was housed inside this pavilion. 
The gazebo was built for the original World's Fair in Audubon Park in 1884. Early Abita Springs developers moved it from New Orleans to its current location. The gazebo and park, however, was hit significantly by Hurricane Katrina and is under repair. In Abita Springs, it's all about the water. And over the years, it has created and spawned a few successful businesses aimed at quenching your thirst, including the Abita Springs Water Company and the Abita Brewery. This is the real quiet area of the brewery, right? Well, it is, actually. <laughs> Dave Blossman is the president of the Abita Brewery. The company produces about 2,500 cases of beer a day. We uh, grew from the tiny little spot in Abita Springs, which is now the Abita Brew Pub, uh, into what we are today, which is uh, yeah, it's still a small company, but uh, definitely has some national notoriety to it. Abita Brewery employs about 34 people, and the plant also produces a root beer made with Louisiana cane sugar. And whether it's root beer or ale, the secret ingredient is the water. All water is that. And we're an anomaly in the brewing industry that all water comes straight out of the source or to our deep artesian wells into the process without any alterations. And it's really uh, an amazing thing. It's like, you know, God intended us to make great beer with this great water. And it wouldn't be the same if it wasn't this water. One time I was in Chicago and I ordered a, ordered a beer. beer. And I told the waitress, I said, I'm from the town where they make it. And she says, where's that? I said, Abita Springs, Louisiana. She said, do you drink it? I said, drink it all the time. And, and they uh, had it? They had it. Yeah. So it's spread out around the country. What goes better with a cool beverage than some good music? And the Abita Springs Town Hall is home to some of the finest in old time country music with regularly scheduled Opry concerts. I'm Pat Fuller. You know, we're the Evening Star String Band from Abita Springs, Louisiana. the Bible through and through, but he went down in deep ellum, now his preaching days are through. Oh, sweet mama, daddy's got the deep ellum blue. I'll guarantee we'll have fun and laugh. Looking back to see if you were looking back to see. As Abita Springs enters its second century in a post-Katrina world, it is likely the population will expand again taking on those looking for refuge, like so many that came before them. When I was young, I had a lot of pep. I could get around, didn't need no help. Now I'm old and turning gray. The girls all look at me and say, too old, too old. He's too old to cut the mustard anymore. He's a-getting too old. He's done got too Abita Springs is also a hub of activity for cyclists with the Tammany Trace. It's a 31 mile long bike path that extends to Slidell and if you ever get a chance take a trip on the Trace followed with a stop back at the Abita Brew Pub. Well that will do it for this edition of Lost Louisiana. What's in a name? Part 2. Just from that one question, it is amazing what Louisiana stories you can uncover. And for any other questions, make sure you bring them right here to the new State Museum in Baton Rouge, located just across the street from the State Capitol. I'm Charlie Winham. Thanks for joining us, and I hope to see you again for another edition of Lost Louisiana.